and find five people, amen. Find five people and just, just press on them and say, I press. Just press on them and say, I press. I press. Amen. <laughs> press on them, I press. Come on. I press on them. I we are beginning 2017 in a new series called Momentum. Would you say that? Momentum. Momentum, Momentum is the idea that if something is progressing, it is likely to continue to progress because it has momentum. In physics, it is the measurement of mass and movement, but in our spiritual walk and even our psychological walk, it is simply the idea that when you gain energy and begin to exert that, you continue to gain and exert energy. Okay, let me see if I can make it plain as I shared with those who were on our prayer call. I remember playing football. I played football for two years, my freshman and sophomore year, and I was a superstar. Everybody knew Rev who sat on the bench. Amen. Everybody knew uh, if they needed to get a prayer through to see Rev who sat on the bench. Amen. In practice, on one occasion, I don't know what the purpose of the drill. I don't know what the drill was called, but it was my task to run as fast as I can and hit a very large player who was one of the superstars on the team. I don't know why we were doing the drill. It didn't seem logical or make sense to me. He was much larger, taller, weighed more than I, and so they told me, what you're going to do is run and hit him as though to get by him with all your might. Now, I was thinking, I don't know why we're doing this. This dude is big, he's strong, I am not. I'm small, I'm shorter, I weigh less. I was thin then, I weigh less. There's no way this is going to work. But something within me said, here's what you need to do, run with all your might. And so what I did is I took off as though I were on a track and I ran with all the speed I had, with all the might I had, and with all the mass I had, and I hit him as hard as I could, and incidentally, I ran through him. Yeah, that's what I was doing. I was saying, what happened? Because it didn't make sense to me. How in the world could someone smaller, or shorter, with less power, me, weak, run through this strong player? And the, the reason I was able to do that was because of momentum. Because he was standing still and I was moving, I was able to move right through him. And the reality of, in our life is God encourages and reminds us that we can build up a spiritual momentum to move through some of the problems, to move through some of the pains, to move through some of the roadblocks in our life. God is saying that this is a wonderful way to start the new year with energy, with zest, and with zeal. And I hear you saying from the outset, Rev, energy and zest and zeal doesn't do everything. You're right, but it does do something. And nothing happens without energy, zest, or zeal. In fact, if you don't have energy, zest, or zeal, you're classified as dead. And I want you to know that God doesn't want his church nor you to be dead. God wants us to be alive. God's us, God wants us to be revived. God wants us to be full of energy. In fact, I know I'm in the Bible because it's Jesus who walked through the temple, turning over the tables, and he simply said, zeal for my house has set me on fire. And, and incidentally, it's Jeremiah who said, it's like fire shut up in my bone. God calls us to be full of passion. And so Paul writes this note to you and me, and in it he's teaching, but he's not just teaching, he's testifying because Paul testifies right here. He says, look, First Baptist, I want you to know that what I'm doing, I am pressing toward the mark. Uh, I'm not worried about what happened back then. I'm not worried what happened over there, but I'm focused on the high calling. I am pressing toward the mark. I'm doing everything God has called me to do. I can't get in your business. I don't want to know who you with, what you're doing, because I'm pressing toward the mark. I'm not trying to find out about your money, your boo, your situation. I'm focused on doing what God called me to do. I am pressing toward the mark. I'm passionate about the call on my life and what God has called me to do. My prayer is and challenge is that some of us who have gone to sleep spiritually might wake up. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the person next to you. That some of us have become quite calm and cold in our relationship with God. Stay with me. I'm still preaching. I need you to get this. But Paul says you got to have some oomph or some energy. In relationships or romance, we call it passion. In sports, we call it strength. In business, we call it drive. In personality, we call it enthusiasm. God says, I want you to be alive. Because when you decide to be alive, I will do great things through you. 
Paul, this, this tent maker from Tarsus, this gospel globe trotter, Paul pins to us his testimony and he says, I want you to share it too. And here's the first thing that he wants us to understand about momentum. If we're going to have momentum, it's going to show up in intensity. Would you say intensity? intensity. That's the initial energy that's necessary to transform inertia. Okay, that's the initial energy that's necessary to get us to get up and go when we lost our get up and go. Okay, y'all missed that. That's me saying I got to move if I'm ever going to move. Okay, uh, that's me saying, I, 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 if God has called me to get in shape, to go to the gym, I won't feel like going to the gym for a long time, but I'm still going to make myself go to the gym. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to me. If, if God says, uh, if I want you to save initially, it's going to take me some energy to get going in my saving, but I can't do it if I have some intensity. Here's how we measure, or here's how we consider intensity. I'm in the text because he says, brethren, I count not myself. I, I count not, my, that's, a, that's, a, that's a banking term he uses. He, he says, I, I look at the pluses and minuses, I look at it all, and the first thing I can say is, I have not achieved and I have not arrived. Okay, y'all not feeling me? Let me see if I can make it. Here is the man who wrote the majority of the New Testament. And he says, I have not arrived. Woo! Uh, okay, okay. He didn't go to Virginia Union. He, he went to Gamaliel, the leading teacher of his day. Uh, Paul knew it all. And Paul says, I have not arrived. Oh, okay, Paul got beat on multiple occasions for his faith. And Paul says, I'm not there yet. I'm still pressing. Okay. He, he starts off with an evaluation, and he's looking at the value of where he is in his current walk. And I see the challenges on your face. I understand that. Here's the challenge. You say, well, how do we measure? How do we measure our momentum? How do we measure where we stand in our passion with God? First, let me tell you, it, 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 it's not necessarily easy because sometimes we like to look at the big things when it's really the small things. I was reading recently in USA Today, and in reading USA Today, it was interesting because they talked about this, Amer uh, this emergency hurricane shelter that was built to withstand hurricanes. <laughs> Massive hurricanes, powerful hurricanes could hit up against this shelter and it would stand strong. It wouldn't shake and it wouldn't move. In fact, they said they built it to withstand even fire. They built it to withstand even water. They built this hurricane shelter to withstand just about anything. And they said, now we have to tear it down. We have to tear it down because some termites have ruined its foundation. And sometimes in our walk, we focus only on the big things and we forget it's the small things that can mess up our foundation. We forget that the devil's been at this for a long time, so he creeps in and he messes with our foundation. Let me give you some biblical markers, and they are biblical. Let me give them to you. I'm going to teach them while I preach it. Uh, it, it, it in fact, it, it's the first thing that you want to look at if you want to measure where your walk is or your passion is or your fire is or your zest is or your zeal is or your enthusiasm is or your energy is with God is versus the love for the lost. Would you say that love for the lost? Love. Please don't say it so excited. You might scare someone. The love for the lost. It's the idea, do I have an earnest love for those who are lost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I more concerned about the pews or the people? Okay, I'll just keep on preaching. Do I have a love for the lost? It, it was the, the, the writer George Bernard Shaw who said the greatest sin is the sin of apathy towards others. It is the sin of seeing people as less than precious to God. And I believe he was right because it's Matthew chapter 9, uh, 35 that teaches us what Jesus saw and sees this multitude. And, and he says they're like sheep being led to the slaughter. Then he says, he, he said, uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He said, this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, pray with me that God might send out us to those who are lost. So the, the first issue is, if you want to know if you have a passion, if you are on fire for Christ, uh, I'm not going to ask you if you cuss every now and then. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm going to say no, that, that, that matters too. But I'm going to say first, do you have a love for the lost? Does it earnestly bother you when people don't know Jesus? 
The fact that they're at home in your house right now, does it bother you that they don't know Jesus? Does it bother you that if they were to die today, it's very possible they might go straight to hell and it's hot down there? Did I say that? Yes, I did. Uh, did, did, did. Does it bother you that people are perishing every day? That's the question that you and I have to answer. Because if you can answer that with, no, it doesn't bother me, then your heart is not aligned to the heart of God. But if there's something within that you cannot explain, if there's something within that you cannot restrain, if there's something within that calls you to use your measly gifts to draw people to Christ, whether it's coaching or singing, teaching or preaching, whatever it is, ushering, giving, I don't know, whatever gift you have, capacity you have to drive others to Christ, stay with me, then you can say, I've aligned my heart to Christ because I got a love for the lost. First, it's a love for the laws, but then it's a hunger for holy. Do you deeply desire that which is holy? I'm not talking about uh, not wanting to get caught. I'm talking about not wanting to fall. Oh, oh man, y'all missed that. I I'm talking about asking God, God, is everything within me pleasing you? You know, there's a major difference in not wanting to get caught and, and really wanting to be holy. Are y'all with me? You know, if I don't want to get caught, I, I figure, you know, I'm going to look, but I don't want nobody to know that I'm looking. Okay, y'all, let me just move on. Uh, it's the idea that something within me hates the sin in me. And so Paul would say it this way. He said, who can deliver me from this body of sin? Thanks be to God. We got to get to the place where we earnestly want to be holy before God. We want to be distinct before God. When we look at ourselves, it, it brings us to tears. When your sin hurts your heart, then you know that you are aligning to Christ. But when your sin irritates you, when you get on your nerves, when your inability to walk right and talk right and love right and give right, when it bothers you, then something is right. Woo! <laughs> it, it, it's a hunger for holy. It's a, so first it's a love for the lost, but then it's a hunger for holy. But he, let me give you one last one, and then I'll move on. It, it, it's a zeal for his house. Amen. Let the church be silent. Amen. Amen. If you understand the scriptures, in fact, it's Psalm 69, verse 9, where David says, God, you've given me a zeal for your house. And Jesus would come along, and he would repeat the very same words, God, you've given me a zeal for your house. Uh, and in fact, it's Haggai who says, how can you live in plush houses and let my house go to pieces? Because if you've got a heart for me, then you understand that I work in and through my house. I told you I would heal at my house. I told you I would help at my house. I told you I would forgive at my house. So you know my house is significant for me. When you understand that God values his house, then you have a passion for God's house. And I'm talking about First Baptist, but I'm not just talking about First Baptist. I'm talking about the universal church. I'm talking about every house of God where people come together and pray together, where, where the sick can come and be prayed over, where the confused can be loved, where those who have been hurt by their past and have been damaged in this day can come and find a place of safe grace, that, where they'll know that they're loved no matter what others think about them. God says you ought to have a passion, a zeal for my house. So first, evaluate. And after your evaluation, I hope that you can agree with me that you have not yet arrived. You look good. I mean, some of the best hairdos today I've seen in a long time. You look good. But you have not yet arrived. I have not yet arrived. So, so don't, don't flirt with yourself. We ain't got it yet but we're moving in the right direction. So first it's evaluate, but then Paul does something. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before. The next thing is he offers, first I evaluate, but then I got to separate. I, I got to separate. And in particular, he says, I got to separate from the things that I become fixated on. He says, first I got to separate from my past success. Amen. For those of you who have been the Lord a little while, wave your hand. You, you, you accept the Lord. You serve the Lord. You walk right before the Lord. Recently, my wife asked me and said, she said, baby, do you, do you think we have a good relationship? And I said, I think we have a great relationship. We've been at it for almost 15 years now. Great relationship. But the truth is, we got to 
let go of some of our past successes. Because our past success doesn't speak to our effort and our work presently. Okay, let me say, it. if I buy my wife three dozen roses for this Valentine, I can't spread those out across the next three Valentine days because it's only good for the day. And so what Paul says is don't become fixated on today and the present or past success. Okay, okay. Uh, I don't know if you watch football. Uh, I watch some football for relaxation. I really do. Uh, one of the teams I watch is the University of Alabama, Roll Tide Roll. And the University of Alabama always wins. They always win because they understand momentum. But here's another thing. Uh, in fact, they played yesterday, and after playing, they were interviewing the coach, Coach David. They interviewed him, talked about him. And one of the things he, you notice about him is he was really sober. He wasn't jumping up and skipping like, we beat him, we beat him. No, no, no. He was calm, cool, and collect. Because he understood that, yes, we won today, but we've got another game next week. And the reason he always wins is because he has the maturity to understand, I can't get so fixated on today that I forget about tomorrow. And so what Paul is saying, yes, I've done some good things. Yes, I've seen the, uh, uh, the heavens. And yes, the Lord has spoken to me. And yes, the Lord has used me. And yes, I'm desperate and need the Lord. He understood that his past success was not enough to keep him. He had to keep pressing toward the mark. But not only that, and I even like this better, he also understood that his past failures could not keep him. Y'all missed that. He understood that his past failures could not keep him back. Are you getting this? The, the reality that is, no matter what you've done in your past, God says, it's past. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm sorry. Let me try to take calm here. I don't care how many times, I don't care where it was, I don't care with who it was, I don't care what you did and how you did it, God says, it's past. And God is arguing with you to get over your past. You keep bringing your past to God and God keeps telling you, I don't know about that, I've forgotten that, I've cast that into the sea of forgetfulness. In fact, the truth is, God is waiting for you to get over you. I mean, he's waiting. I would, God, but you know. In, in fact, remember, it's Paul who persecuted the church. I looked that word up, and the word literally is the word we get hunting from. Paul hunted down the church. In fact, we're getting ready to ordain some deacons. Well, you know, the first deacon that was killed was killed by Paul. Deacons, amen. Say amen right there. Uh, uh, hey, the, the, the truth is, Paul saw to it that Stephen was stoned to death. And he'd even thrown a stone. He, he, he told somebody, hold my coat. And he made sure that Paul or Stephen was stoned. There was a lot on Paul. But Paul did not let him his past keep him down. In fact, he said, my past is my past. And no matter what my past is, you, in fact, let me, let me tell you a secret about your past, uh, about your past and the truth about the past. All of us have some skeletons in the closet. In, in fact, some of you have some bodies in the closet, I'm just playing. Uh, all of us have some skeletons in the closet. And this is why we do not get fixated with people's past. My God, let me see if I can make it. This is why we do not get fixated with people's past. Because the past is just that. And we cannot be held accountable for that which is past. When you start this, when you think this way, when you live this way, then you'll have a powerful life because you will recognize that God says, my past is forgiven. My past is washed away. My past is no more. My past is under the blood. In fact, let me move on. Woo! But you understand that it's not about your present successes. It's not about even your past failures, but it's about the present grace of God. And so with that, I'm going to take my seat here. After he evaluates, then he says, I got to separate. Then he said, the last thing he does is he says, he says look, uh, uh, what I'm going to do after I evaluate and I separate is I'm going to concentrate. But some of y'all not concentrating now. Let me see if I can help you. He, he says, I'm going to fixate my full attention on God. And nothing will stop me from fixating 
and focusing on what God has told me to be and do. Wake your neighbor up real quick. God, here's what I, I'm gonna focus totally all my attention on the things of God. Right. Nothing can interrupt me. Nothing can distract me. No one can distract me because I am fixated and focused on my God. Nothing can interrupt my attention. It doesn't matter who doesn't speak to me. It doesn't matter who does speak to me. It doesn't matter what you think about me. I am focused on God. God has my complete attention. There is nothing that can separate my focus. Okay, okay, y'all not feeling me. Uh, 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 about five years ago, I told you the story. I'll tell you again. It was a story of a little boy. He wanted to be a neurologist. You know, a neurologist. He wanted to study the brain. He was a little boy. He couldn't say neurologist, much less spell neurologist, but he wanted to be a neurologist. He grew up in a poor home, didn't have much, but his mom and his daddy kept encouraging him. They kept saying, you can do it, son. You can do it, boy. We believe in you. You're going to be a neurologist. You can do it, son. We believe in you. You're going to be all right. You can do it, son. Stay with me. We're focused. We're fixated. Uh, you can do it. And so off he went to college. He didn't have much money. Stay with me. He didn't have much money. He, he didn't have much opportunity, but he got into college. And when he got into college, he decided that he would do his very best. And he did his very best. In fact, he was so focused on what God called him to do that he didn't hang out at the parties, that he didn't go to the clubs, that he didn't drop it like it was hot, but he did what God told him to do. He was focused only on what God told him to do. He did everything God told him to do, and only what God, he would stay up and study. Other people were doing everything, but he was studying. They were going to bike weekend in Florida. They, they were going to Atlanta. They were doing all sorts, but he was focused. In fact, when he went to graduate school, uh, he was going to go to medical school, he got home from college and his parents were so happy to see him. They could only see him twice a year. And, and he was so happy uh, that after dinner, he said, I got to go to bed. His parents said, well, why do you have to go to bed so early? It's still early. It's only 8 o'clock. He said, well, I, I like to get up in the middle of the night and study. So his dad said, now, now son, we believe in you. We're proud of you, but you can slow down. You can calm down. You don't have to be this on fire. I mean, folk are going to think you cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. Calm down, brother. And he said, well, I, I can't help myself. I'm on fire. And, and so late that night, I don't know if it was 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., the father was in bed, but he heard something in the bottom of the house. He heard something that was distracting him. And so the father got up out of his sleep, and the father took his flashlight like it was a gun, and he went downstairs looking around. He's looking around his own house, trying to figure out where the noise is coming from. He thought he had gotten rid of the rodent, so he didn't know what it was. Until finally, his flashlight hit the kitchen table. And underneath the kitchen table was his son, sitting underneath the kitchen table, playing with yarn. And at that, he turned on the lights and he, he called his wife. He said, baby, baby, come downstairs. They started to cry and they said, oh, Johnny, we knew that you were too intense. We knew that you were too focused. We knew something just was going to happen and hurt you. And, and now you've gone crazy, Johnny. Now you lost it, Johnny. And Johnny said, oh, no, I haven't lost my mind. My professors told me if I was going to be a great brain surgeon, I'd have to learn to tie teeny tiny knots in dark places. And I was practicing tying teeny tiny knots in dark places. All I'm trying to say is, God says, if you're going to do and be everything I've called you to be and do everything I've called you, to, what you got to do is you got to be so focused that folks will look at you and say, she got to be crazy. Going to church and singing in the snow and the rain. He got to be on his. What, what in the world are they doing? Why are they gathering together to pray so early at 7 a.m.? Why are they holding hands and talking to God in other tongues? Why, why are they worshiping with all that zeal and energy? Why are they dancing like that? Something must be wrong. You got to be willing to look a little crazy because you're so focused on what God has called you to focus on. So, so Paul. Uh, take a seat. I'm almost done. I promise. So, so Paul says, I press toward the mark of the high calling. Yeah. Now, please understand this is biblical language. The I press toward the mark of the high calling. Yeah. The high calling was, in fact, a, a very special occasion in the Olympics of their day. In the Greek Olympics, the Agana feet would call for the high call. Okay, y'all are feeling me. Let, let me. Let me see if I can make a play. I promise you I'm done. You've been wonderful. Uh, I'm a fan of Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis is a football player. He, he played for the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, the reason I like Ray Lewis is because he was a little crazy. Yeah, every game he would come and be like, yeah! 
We're going to win. He would have the whole team crunk on fire. And, and, and so every game he was like that uh, until his retiring year in 2012, his retiring, retiring year in 2012, he tore his tricep. His muscle, while contracting it so tight and strong, he tore his, severed his muscle from the bone. The doctor came over immediately and recognized that there was a bulge at the bottom of his arm. She pressed on his arm and recognized there was no muscle there. It had fallen. She began to cry. She said, Ray, you know your career is over. You're going to have to retire. This is October. He said, no, my career is not over. He had surgery. He went to therapy. And he kept encouraging his team. He did something that everyone said could not happen. He walked back on the football field and began to play again. He began to encourage his team with this passion and this press. And of course, they went on to the Super Bowl. But the night of the Super Bowl, he described something that happened. He couldn't explain why, but while he was in his hotel room, his muscle snapped again. He said, I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't tell the doctors because they couldn't help me. I couldn't tell my teammates because they would be discouraged. So I thought, what I need to do is get a couple hours of sleep. But he couldn't move his arm. So he took a shoestring and he tied it to his wrist. He took the other side of the shoestring and he tied it up in the air in his hotel room. And he slept with his arm in the air. The next day, if you watch, you can tell something is wrong with this man. But he runs on the football field. In fact, he makes seven tackles. Four all by himself. All with a torn arm. All with a muscle out of place. And he talks about the reason he was able to do that because he learned to focus despite the pain. When his mama used to get beat, he would take a deck of cards and would throw a card down and for every number that showed up, he would do push-ups. He knew so much pain as a child, he said, I would use the fact that I've experienced pain before to push me to higher heights. <laughs> Can I come by and talk to you for a minute? I know you've seen some pain and some heartache. I know everything hasn't gone well for you. I know it hasn't always been fair. I know it's hurt sometimes. But I'm telling you that God is saying that you can use all the pain in your past to make you press towards higher heights. He says, I press toward the mark of the high calling. The high calling was when the Agonathi, the official, looked down at the athletes on the field. And every now and then, one athlete would push so hard that the leader of the event would call them up into the stands. And instead of sending a reef reward down, they'd give them a reef reward up in higher places. And all I'm trying to say is God is saying that he's watching you run your race. He knows how many hours you work. He knows how much pain you suffer. He knows how much discouragement you've gone through. But he's watching and he's waiting. He's saying, there'll come a day when what I will do is I will call you up. And when I call you up, I'm not going to give you a crown made by man's hands. But I'm going to give you a crown of life. I'm going to say you run the race. You finished the course. You fought the fight. And there is now laid up for you a reward. When others walked away, you walked in. When others fell asleep, you prayed through. When others said no, you said yes. You said, God, use me any way you want to use me. And I'll be satisfied. God says, I'm looking for somebody who I can call up to higher places. And I can reward for their labor. I can say, well done. Keep running your race. Well done. Don't throw in the towel. Well done. If you have to run all by yourself, run all by yourself because God is looking down and he's saying, well done, my child. The church is standing to our feet. The gospel has been preached. The challenge for us is to be faithful to